Hello. Can you hear me OK? Yeah? yeah. All right. OK, so I'm slightly nervous, because usually when I talk about testing, it's to audiences who care about testing. And the React community, I think, is you know, <laughs> a little bit, well, I'm not going to say. OK, so there's, there's two parts to this talk. Um, the first part, the majority of it, I'm going to talk to you about six ideas that I think can improve your testing. Uh, and the second part of the talk is some philosophy, so some kind of deep thinking about testing in general. Uh, but first, uh, some context setting. So uh, too long didn't listen of this talk is that uh, good tests remove fear of change. So I'm going to talk about fear today and how tests can help you go faster by helping you have confidence in any change you want to make to the codebase. Um, and I think you know if you're if your boss sent you here today, you can. That's it. That's the message. Uh, if you if you're absolutely already dead set against testing, then you know go to sleep now. That's fine. That's the message. Uh, it's not a talk about TDD. So I am a TDDist. I do practice TDD, but I think there's a problem with a lot of talks about TDD, and you probably recognize this yourselves. They're quite shaming. So if you don't practice TDD. They'll make you feel like you're a crap. You don't know what you're doing. You're not a proper developer. Um, and, and I kind of feel like that's not the right approach. So although that is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, the ideas I've got here are things you can apply even if you're not doing TDD. And I, I don't really want to talk too much about that, because um, I'm trying to not turn you off testing. Um, so an example of that, and this has infected our community a little bit, is that a lot of talks will, will tell you, oh, TDD isn't about unit testing, or you're doing it wrong if all your tests are unit tests. And the, the problem with this is that uh, when a perceived authority figure says something like that to you, you believe that as the law, right? Like that's, the, that's true. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, our software laws are not like laws of nature. It's not like the law of gravity. It's not things that are absolutely true. They're things that just somebody made up. Right? So when we're on, we on stage and we're telling you what we believe, it's just stuff that we find works for us. There's no truth in it. It's just our experience. And that, that's the messaging aspect of this. So, and this is true of my talk today as well. So my message to you is that you know, take all this with a pinch of salt. It's just what, stuff that's worked for me, and I know works for other people. It might not work for you. So we all know the uh, 10x developer myth, this idea about a rock star developer. Of course, there are really, really good developers out there. There are people who are fantastically great at what they do, and they work very fast. The problem is that they tend to be very insular, and they work alone, and they can be problematic for teams as a whole. And I like to think of testing as something that is a whole team activity. And that's because it's all about requirements. And requirements help us communicate across the whole team. So I've got an example here of a simple requirement about something. This is something the whole team can talk about and expect in software. And one of the reasons why I think testers can go super fast and uh, accelerate their own work is because they're constantly focusing on these requirements that the whole team understands. So with that said, I want to look at the difference between developer tests and QA tests. Because they're different. And this is, something, this is fundamental to what we do as developers. We are trying to write tests that help us, speed us up. QA tests are more about proving that what we're delivering hasn't broken or it's the correct thing. So there's, there's different things at play there. So to start with, uh, developer tests will encode requirements, like I just talked about. And they'll also catch regression. Right, so they're, they're there. I mean, this is kind of obvious stuff, right? So your automated tests are there to tell you that you haven't caused regression in the software. Well, yeah, QA tests do that as well. So they have that in common. Developer tests also do all these things, right? So they assist you with design to start with. They're going to help you decide if you're testing against the API of your own software, it's going to tell you if it's good or not. It's going to help you make design decisions. It's going to help you. Uh, refactor, because you've got that safety net there. Refactor, refactoring, you know, the kind of standard definition we're told of refactoring is that it's changing the internals, but the external behavior remains the same. And that's the regression part of our test. They explain your code to others. That's like comments. Tests are these amazing things because they're like comments, but they've got this verifiable proof with them. 
right? So often you'll find testers who never write comments because they don't need them. Their tests are the comments. They pinpoint errors. I'm going to come back to that one in detail. So I'll skip it for now. And uh, they minimize debugging and they minimize manual testing. So this is, this is probably the, the biggest thing I see about the React community a lot. Everybody's very much about you know, the latest browser plugins or the console environment in the browser. That's a really slow thing to do, right? If you're writing good tests, you should never have to debug. OK, like never. You know, the ideal situation would be you'd never be debugging, because debugging takes a lot of time. If you can write a test that proves that where a failure is, then you've got a little repeatable unit there that is going to help you every single time you have to uh, check your changes. So if you're trying to fix something, you can make a change, see if it passes the test. And the same with manual testing. Right, who actually wants to use software? Right? Like, software is a horrible thing most of the time. Um, you know, and again, it takes time to load up your app, um, to kind of get to the point that you're trying to test or figure out. That takes a lot of time. QA tests do a, a few other things as well. I've, here's just two I've thought of off the top of my head. Probably a bunch of other things that QA tests are there to do as well. But they're different, right? So these uh, top two, assist with design and guide refactoring, that's kind of what I'm talking about, removing fear of change. So if you have your tests there uh, in place and they're good quality tests, then you're not going to be afraid to change the code underneath. You're not going to be afraid to play with the design because you know you've got all these automated checks, right? So I, I guess I'd challenge you to maybe think about that emotion of fear in your own code. Does it affect you? Do you have moments in your coding process where you're scared to change code or scared to touch a class? Maybe there's a component you have that you know is absolutely horrendous. All of the bugs are in that component. Uh, you don't want to touch it because you know that something's going to break if you do touch it. That's the kind of fear that good tests will help you avoid entirely. So these last four are about reducing dev time, plain and simple. Um, so you know, we'll talk. About, I'm going to talk about pinpoint errors in a little bit. The rest I'm going to leave to the side for now. Okay, let's move on to the six ideas then. First one, very simple. Uh, hopefully, you know, if there are beginners in the room who have never tested, um, this might be new to you. I hope some people this will already be familiar to you. Your tests should always be in this format, arrange, act, assert. First part, you set up uh, your uh, inputs, your collaborators. The middle part, that's where I've got this render call. That's the action. That's the thing your test is, act, uh, your test is acting on. So that's uh, what the requirement is, uh, the behavioral requirement. So here I'm saying when I render the component, I expect this thing to happen. And the expectation is the assertion. So there's always these three parts. And by the way, I, a lot of my tests are this simple. Right? So if you've got tests that are dozens of lines long, they're, 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 they could probably be simplified into a few different tests that look like this. So idea two, again, I'm hoping this is familiar to some of you. You want to test the external behavior of your components. This is true for all types of software, functions, classes, React components. It's always true. You want to be focusing on that on the behavior the external users of that component or class see, uh, not the internal state. And I'll talk about that in a second. So we, we saw an example in the last slide where I, I rendered the component. So that's one part of the component lifecycle, right? You, you mount a component. Here I'm clicking a button. So the action is I'm clicking a button, another part of the uh, lifecycle of a component. This click function, I'm going to show it later. It's interacting with the DOM actually. So I'm not calling a component's internal handle click function. I'm actually instrumenting the DOM here to say, OK, I'm clicking on that button that I expect to be uh, in the DOM. Here's submitting a form. Same thing, right? S submit a form using the DOM API. The action is submitting a form. And again, that causes some lifecycle to happen uh, in your component. Another thing, uh, this is slightly more complicated. This is uh, getting updates to props, right? So how do we, how do we f test what happens in our class, our uh, component, or our function when things change? Well, we can call it multiple times. So with this component, we render twice. And I'm going to show the definition of render and wait in a little bit. 
but in this case, that's going to trigger all of the code we have to update props in our component. Uh, before I move on from this idea, I did mention about not testing state. And I don't have an example of that. Uh, I was kind of challenged to write, show an example of not testing state. And it's, I realize it's really hard when you haven't done something for a long time to come up with an example of th that thing that you believe to be wrong. Um, so I don't have an example for you. But it, the, the, the thing about testing state is it's brittle. Right? So when you're testing things and you're testing the external behavior, you're doing that because you want the ability to change how it works inside. You want to be able to refactor things. And if you're testing state, you're very locked in to how that component operates. So as soon as you want to change something, you're going to have to change your test, even though the external behavior hasn't changed. OK, idea three. We're getting a little bit more complicated here now. So be aware of the test surface area. Every React application is a tree of components. Right? You've got a root component, and then you've got a bunch of components inside of that. And this is where people get confused about unit testing. So if we write tests for A, those tests are testing the behavior of A and the behavior of C and D as well, all of that. So the surface area is all of that gray box. That means if there's an error, if any of your tests for A fail, you're not entirely sure whether the failure was in A or C or D. You've got to hunt that down. Right? So if maybe you've got some tests like this that have failed, and you've had to go and search for why they failed. Good tests pinpoint errors. That means you don't have to search for why it failed. A good test will tell you immediately why it failed and, and point to the three or four lines of code that the failure could exist in. So when I'm talking about going faster through your test, this is, this is kind of what I mean. Great tests will immediately say, hey, there's a problem in this part of the code. Go and fix it. So if you've got tests A, you know, that's not really the case. Whereas if I've got tests against B, the surface area is much smaller. If a failure happens in one of my tests for B, I know that the error has got to be in B. So a way we can get around that is writing tests just at D. Right? So there are these different levels of tests. They're all, unit, they're, they're all unit tests in a way. You, know, you can call them whatever you want. It's fine to write tests at A. It's also fine to write tests at D. And this is one of the, the benefits, as I said, about refactoring the tests. We get to make a mess, first of all. So on the previous slide, I had A, and then I had C and D as part of that. And I talked about how you know, if you have the test just this level of A, then you might be in trouble. But that's actually a perfectly normal situation to be in, because when we make a mess with tests, we'll often just hack together code. And this is another way that we, uh, we get speed in our development. We've got the test to back us up, so we make a mess, first of all. That means we don't think. Right? We don't stop to think about the design. We don't stop to decide whether we've got the right layout of our components already. We just write it all in one long procedure. So maybe A ended up because of that. It was just this one big, long component because we decided we were going to make a mess. And then at that point, we've got the tests there. So we've written all of our tests. We've got A, but it's a bit of a mess. We are safe to refactor that. And maybe we extract out C and D, because we think that's the cleaner thing to do. So we do the design thinking afterwards, when we have our tests there to, to back us up. And we're safe to do it. And we don't have that fear of change. So you know, then that's a good point. Maybe, you want to, maybe then that's when you realize your tests for A aren't helping you. So you decide, OK, I'm going to go and refactor those and pull out some tests for D. So that's why unit tests are important. OK, idea five. We're getting into the big ideas now. Uh, this, is, this is common advice in every language, in every framework. You know, if you're writing in Ruby on Rails, it's the same, same deal. Uh, you don't want to have a you know, Ruby on Rails application. You don't want to have a React application. You want to have an application that happens to use React. For your tests, writing tests for React components is complicated. You have to deal with lifecycle, like we already talked about. Uh, you, you've got to use these testing libraries. Um, testing simple functions, super easy. right? You're just testing what you put into the function and what you get out of the function. Those tests are very simple. So any business logic, pull out of your components. That's kind of what Redux is doing in a way. Uh, people, I'm always interested in how people define 
com complexity. People think Redux is complex and React is simple. Well, actually, from a test point of view, it's the other way around. Right? So, because Redux, when you're building into Redux, you're just writing functions. It's very simple to test functions. React components, not so simple to test. And that, that point of the, the last point there, that's super important. Even an if statement is complexity. And I'm going to uh, come back to that in a little bit. So idea six, you know, this is a big idea. So yeah, it's absolutely fine to use Enzyme uh, and use React testing library, but they're actually not that complicated. And I'm going to give you three reasons why I think you might want to try writing your own test library. The um, first one is that it's a really good way to further your learning. So if you're not sure how the DOM API works, it's a great way to learn. That's all these testing libraries are doing to an extent, is just instrumenting the DOM. So they're clicking on buttons for you. They're rendering React components for you. It's actually not too difficult, and you'll learn a lot by uh, redoing that yourself. Second point, this is slightly more subtle, but it's a very important one. Uh, they lock you into their way of working. So if you're using Enzyme, for example, you're going to write your tests the way Enzyme want you to write tests. And as a tester, you know, yeah, I might have my dogmatic view of how I want to write tests, but I don't necessarily want to lock you into doing the same thing. You know, really, it, you're just dealing with React components in the DOM. There's so many ways to test that. And they're all, many of them are perfectly valid. But if you use a testing library, you're not going to have the chance to uh, explore that uh, I think this has come up quite recently because I've heard of a lot of people not migrating to hooks because their testing library doesn't support it. You know, my response to that is, well, you know, you don't need the testing library, right? Like, just move to hooks. Um, obviously, that's a that just is a huge just, right? But it's a, maybe something to think about. Um, and third point, you know, you don't necessarily need to learn yet another library, right? Learn the DOM API. That's always going to be important. It's always going to be useful for you to know. Uh, so in a way, it's simpler, right? So if you're teaching novices, it might be simpler to just teach them the DOM API rather than teaching them, yeah, another library. So here's some examples. I, you've already seen all these functions. These are the functions I use to test my code. Um, render and wait, so that just calls the render function and wraps it in an act call. And, Element so that I can use I'll sh uh, that, that, that I can use my expectations, which I think you've already seen on a previous slide. It just calls the query selector API. Click calls the uh, React test utils package, which is already there for you. And the same with submit. Right. So these the way I test, I just write a bunch of little helpers like this. Uh, you know, and roll my own. It works for shallow rendering too. Right. So I'm not going to show you the code because it's slightly more complex, and I I don't want to focus on the code. I want to focus on the idea. So I've got a function element matching, which just walks through the tree of uh, React component instances, which the React shallow renderer has produced for me. So again, you know, this, is a, this is a big idea. I'm not saying you need to go and dump your testing libraries. I'm saying that this is a great way to further your learning. And it's entirely possible when people do this. OK, so that's the six ideas. I want to move on to more of the philosophy now. The JavaScript community isn't well known for its testing. I think that's fair to say. It's probably an accident of history more than anything else. But the way that we test is kind of boring. It's been with us for 20 years. So uh, Kent Beck's book in TDD was written almost 20 years ago. Um, so why, why does the JavaScript community not have these ideas? Maybe it's because you believe they're not useful to you, that's fine. Maybe you're scared to read all of the literature that we have on this. So there's so many books about uh, testing. They just, they're not in JavaScript. They're in Ruby or they're in Java. Um, you know, I'd say to you, don't be scared of that. Like, these languages aren't complicated and the ideas apply. They, they can completely apply to React. Um, so, you know, go for it. There's no reason to not want to test. Like I say, testing will help you go faster. Imagine not having to debug, right? <laughs> And that, that's a kind of win for you. Um, so there's a bunch of ideas. I want to look at some books. So the first book uh, is 99 Bottles of OOP by Sandy Metz and Katrina Owen. This is a fantastic book. Uh, uh, it's really about 50 lines of code. The whole book is about 50 lines of code. 
and they pour over every single line in a huge amount of detail. It's, uh, it's impressive. They really focus on what is the best way to write this particular solution. Uh, it's in Ruby, but I believe they're bringing out a JavaScript version uh, later this year. And if you, if you buy it today, though, you'll get the JavaScript version for free, I believe. So you know, go for it. This is a really good book. If you've never focused on that idea of an if statement being business logic, get this. It'll make you realize where complexity really is in software. Uh, then there's XUnit test patterns. This is like every pattern book. It's, it's kind of useful if you've got a bunch of experience and you can read it and read about these patterns and, and say, oh, yeah, I, I recognize that. I do that all the time. You know, so you get this warm, fuzzy feeling from knowing that what you do is what other people are doing. Are doing. All you're really doing is learning somebody else's name for that pattern. Um, so I wouldn't say if you're a beginner, read this book. It's a, it's a good one to just pick up um, if you've got any experience at all. Um, and it's very detailed. It's not a light read, I'll tell you that. Um, and then finally, th there's my book. I couldn't not get a plug for this in. <laughs> it is a book about TDD, uh, but it is about testing in JavaScript. So if you're scared of other languages, come understand that. You know, all, there are not many JavaScript books about testing. Um, here, here's the way I do it. And again, about messaging. I'm, in this book, I'm not saying this is how you should test React components. It's just a way that works for me. And it's some ideas that you might find useful. OK. So I want to talk about snapshots. So snapshot testing, <clears throat> uh, that, you know, it's a useful way to check uh, your component's visual state. Right? So you can check if there are unexpected changes. So it, it's a kind of mechanism to catch for regression. And you can visually inspect the HTML. So they're useful. But if you look at the ideas I've, I've shown you in the previous slides, you'll see there's some things that they don't quite uh, solve. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing I've noticed with snapshots is that people ignore them. Right? They're noisy. They break all the time. And so you just update snapshots. You get into this habit of just updating snapshots. You don't really look at why they've fallen over. The other thing is, and this is something I kind of, you know, I've been talking about going faster as a developer. Uh, part of the idea of snapshots is that you check them in, right? You, you put them in your PRs, and you should visually diff the changes. I mean, this is, to me, this is, you know, why would I do that? Right? I want to go faster, and you're, you're telling me I should, you know, look through these huge generated files for differences and see if they're right. I mean, it doesn't fit with how I want to work. Like, I want to go faster, and I want techniques that are going to, um, give me confidence, but not slow me down as a result. So yeah, I do think they're great. And if they're the only kind of test you have, uh, you know, stick with them. I'm not saying delete all your snapshots. But I want to go through our list of what I defined developer tests to be earlier. <clears throat> so do they encode requirements? No, they don't really tell you anything about what your software is meant to do. They just say, you know, hey, here's some HTML. It's not, it doesn't really tell you, well, I expect this field to be a required field or anything like that. Do they catch regression? Um, well, yeah, I mean, they do, right? They, they're absolutely there to catch regression. But they're also noisy, as I said. So I'm going to give this a thinking face emoji. I'm not going to squirt it out. Uh, do they assist with design? Um, I don't think so. I mean, th the design help comes from writing tests and using your API and deciding, well, is this, is this test difficult to write? If the test is difficult to write, maybe I need to work on my design. That's what good tests will, will give you. Snapshots don't give you that design feedback. Same with refactoring. So refactoring is partly design, but it's also partly regression, right? So if we go back to the definition of refactoring, it's that uh, you want to be able to make internal changes but maintain the external behavior. So, you know, snapshots help us do that. So I'm going to give that another thinking face. Um, almost want to get a green tick, but they don't explain your code to others, so they're not comments. Uh, they don't pinpoint errors. I don't think they minimize debugging, because if they break, you still have to figure out why. <clears throat> and I guess the same is true for manual testing. So, you know, yeah, like I said, these are great. And I, I said right at the start, I don't want to have this be a TDD talk about shaming you into doing something else. Snapshots are perfectly fine. 
But uh, if, I, if I think about tests and developer tests, uh, I want to be writing great tests, tests that help me go faster, right? Help me produce software of higher quality that's more valuable to my clients. And usually when we start writing tests, we start out writing bad tests. And this is why a lot of people stop writing tests, is because they, they're writing bad tests that slow them down. They're writing things that you know, they have to go back and fix because the tests are brittle, or they, they, they don't catch regression. It actually takes a lot of effort to get to the point where you're writing great tests. And so people stop because they're writing bad tests, which is unfortunate. You know, in the middle of somewhere, we've got no tests here. And I guess I would ask you, I'm not going to do this, but you know, where do snapshot tests fit on this line? Are they, you know, where are, yeah, I'm not going to answer it. But what I will say is, you know, if, you're, if your answer lies anywhere to the right of no tests, I'd probably want to ask you why, like why you think that. OK, so to finish up, like I said, I'm not, you know, the truth is snapshots are really helpful to us. There are a bunch of other test techniques that also are really helpful to us. And it's worth your time learning them. It's kind of sad that the JavaScript community has forgotten about that. If you've got the confidence to go and read books on testing, yeah, they'll be in Ruby, they'll be in Java. You'll have to get over that. The testing is the same regardless. Um, so my question to you is, you know, what's your fear of getting started? And what are you going to do to you know, go back to your desk on Monday and take some of these ideas into your work and uh, help you improve? Um, and that's it. Thank you.